This episode of Paranormal Heart is brought to you by Nodakian Studios. If you're looking for a fine piece of stoneware pottery, check out Nodakian Studios at nodakianstudios.com, as well as on Facebook, where she periodically gives away pieces of pottery. Again, check out Nodakian Studios at nodakianstudios.com. Welcome to Paranormal Heart, a place where people can talk about their paranormal experiences. With your host, Cat Ward, along with a special segment, Oddities with John Mallard. Welcome back, folks, to Paranormal Heart, where you can find new episodes on the second and last Sunday of each month on Podbean. You can also find us on sparkradionet.org, iTunes, Spreaker, Spotify, YouTube, and any place you find fine podcasts. And this episode's shout-out goes out to my listeners in Egypt. Much love to you all, and thank you so much for listening. Folks, let me know what topic you'd like to hear, or if you have anyone in particular you'd like to hear as a guest. I'll try my best to get them on. And as always, I'm looking for your paranormal encounters. So drop me an email at paranormalheart13 at gmail.com if you'd like to be on the show. Or send me your encounter and I'll read it for everyone if you're not comfortable being a guest on the show. Before I get to my next guest, enjoy Oddities with John Mallard. Over to you, Johnny. Hey everyone, welcome to Oddities. Strange facts that are true about an odd, odd world. Man, this episode is all about your true colors, baby. Here are some more things researchers have found out about people in colors, and maybe some things you haven't actually known about. Here we go. The color pink. Studies show that people almost always believe pastries from a pink box taste better than from any other color box. Men believe pink products do the best job, but don't want to be seen buying them. If they think someone's watching, they'll choose something brown or blue. Speaking of brown, researchers say a brown suit is a symbol of informality that invites people to open up. It's recommended for reporters and counselors alike. The color gray. Your eye actually processes gray more easily than any other color. That's why it's so mostly used in many rooms around the home. Orange. A quick attention getter. When used on a product, orange loudly proclaims that the product is for everyone. Pale blue. Pale blue can actually make people feel cooler. Blue inhibits the desire to eat. In fact, researchers say people tend to eat less from blue plates. So keep that in mind if you guys are trying to lose a few pounds out there. Pick up some blue plates. You might be surprised. Since blue is associated with eating less, marketers use it to sell products like club soda, skim milk, and of course cottage cheese. Yum yum. And of course my favorite color, which just so happens to be the color green, is used to sell vegetables and chewing gum but not meat because it reminds consumers of mold. And isn't that true? I've never seen meat sold in like a green box or green package. That's, that's actually really interesting. It's, it's quite amazing how much our minds actually... Uh, Use color, and when you're aware that color is a thing, you should see it in all the things that are through advertising and stuff like that. Anyhow, I digress, guys. I hope you enjoyed your oddities this month. Don't forget to check out the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal podcast. Back to you, Kent. Thanks so much, Johnny. My guest this episode has been a Bigfoot researcher for over 40 years. He's personally had two encounters himself with the elusive creature and has written several books on the topic. You can find his podcast, Creek Devil on YouTube. Please welcome William Jevning. Hi, Will. Welcome to Paranormal Heart. Hi there. Thanks so much for being here. Um, this is, uh, it's been a little, uh, little difficult trying to get together uh, with uh, your schedule, my schedule, and uh, uh, power outages, <laughs> but oh. we're fi we finally <laughs> made it. <laughs> well, this is a good thing. Yeah. 
And uh, yeah, it's been a while. So um, I'm, I'm very, very happy that you're here. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. So for, um, there's, I'm sure pretty much everyone who listens to the show knows, knows who you are. But uh, before we get into it, why don't you uh, give us a little, um, you know, um, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, just tell people, <laughs> my train derailed. <laughs> um, just tell little folks a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I guess just the quick version would be um, getting into the subject of Bigfoot. Um, happened to me when, in the winter of 1972 when a friend and I found some intestines between the rails of a, a railroad line. And then subsequently we found a whole bunch of Bigfoot tracks. So we didn't know what they were. We'd never heard the word Bigfoot or, or anything like that. So we saw these big footprints and it sort of spooked us that um, the intestines weren't frozen. And it was really, really cold that morning. It was, you know, less than 20 degrees out. So mm. we took off running to the friend's house. We were on our way to, and, um, you know, his dad and brothers and sisters came out and they took pictures and he kind of told us what little he knew. And that was, like I said, December 72. So there wasn't a ton of information and we didn't watch a lot of television and stuff. So, um, you know, kind of sparked our imaginations. My buddies and I were all right about 14 years old. So we went out and looked every weekend and never saw anything. So we kind of forgot about it. And then two years later, uh, just under two years, I actually ran into two of these things near our home. So um, that was a bit of a shock. Uh, a friend of mine contacted John Green. John Green and Renee DeHinnon came to my home uh, the following summer of 1975 and uh, they sort of took me under their wing and the rest is history. I've been involved in this ever since and so it's 47 years of involvement uh, currently. Wow, that's that's a long time. It's a long time and I've got eight books published so far and done a little television, plenty of radio and we, of course we have our own current podcast, Creek Devil. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you guys can uh, check that out on uh, YouTube. And um, where else is your show? It's on Podbean, and we're getting ready to. Uh, we're looking into putting it out through uh, other other outlets. Um, oh, sorry. So yeah. it's not on YouTube. It's, it's on Podbean. No, oh, no, it's it's on. Oh, okay, YouTube, yeah. that's what I thought. Yeah, because I get the notifications. <laughs> <laughs> I start to think, oh crap, <laughs> am I wrong? <laughs> Oh no! I mean, We—it's something we just have fun with, you know. And uh, there's—it's in some informative, some you know—we joke around and just uh, just have a good time with it. Now, Bigfoot's not something that I know a whole lot of, because uh, as you know, my field ma mainly is uh, ghosts, spirits, you know, things like that. But it's mm -hmm. an interest that uh, my husband and I uh, have always had. Um, have listened to you for a while. Have some of your books. And uh, just a fascinating, fascinating topic because um, that little research paper that I did for school last year um, that I had mentioned to you about, um, it was really interesting to know that Bigfoot is seen not just in North America, but he's all over the place. Worldwide, yes. Yes. Uh, known by different names uh, in various countries, but they're, they're pretty much the same creature. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. A few variants, I think. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I think I think anytime you get outside of a like one breeding area, you're going to have some variations just because you know the separation of the gene pools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard some people say uh, it could also have something to do, obviously, with climate as well and uh, with their food source. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of things, a lot of factors play into that. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so. Something that a term that I recently heard about, and I don't know if you've heard about this, called the woo. Have Have you heard of that term? Um. Well, I've heard people use it. Um. Uh, yeah. It's so. Some people believe, and they claim to have experienced this themselves, that Bigfoot can actually disappear in front of their eyes, and they emanate light. And these various abilities are referred to as the woo. So I was just wondering what your thoughts are on it. If, if you knew anything more about it, have you ever witnessed anything like that? No. Um, now one of my contacts, I, I've got a few contacts, uh, former and, and I, I gotta be careful what I say. 
<laughs> about, <laughs> about folks that work in the government because they, they give me information and they uh -huh. they trust me with you know protecting their anonymity. So I get it. Yeah. Um, the normal what we think of as Bigfoot, quote unquote, is a flesh and blood animal. Um, if people are seeing something like what you described, uh, that's actually something else. And, and that's really all I can say at the moment because <laughs> I'm going to be getting more information. But I was told, in fact, very recently that um, that is that is, in fact, something else. It looks similar to mm -hmm. these things, but it's but it's not them. OK, I appreciate whatever information you are able to give us. That's thank you. Uh, no, because growing up, I've heard of, you know, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, and it's always been um, a, a living, breathing creature. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, the past few years, all of a sudden, people are saying that they have abilities. So I always wondered if it was the same creature that they're seeing or. Sometimes I think now we've talked quite a bit about this, about how they move mm -hmm. and how fast they are and, and very agile, highly intelligent. Um, their bone structure is different than ours, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, so they can move in ways that we can't. And. Uh, I think sometimes that throws people off. You know, there, there's mechanisms in our mind that helps us cope with uh, things that are sort of outside of our frame of reference. And and our brains will continue to search for answers and, and put answers in with whatever it is they have in their database, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and I think sometimes um, that gets put in there because their brain can't explain what it is they saw. When in fact, it may have been a very mundane kind of thing. It was just something outside of their uh, ability maybe to cope with that, what it is they saw it was so quick. Or um, I, I, I'll give you an example. Um, I have a friend in Alberta, a uh, Native American yeah. gentleman up there, and he said that he was elk hunting and he heard a noise and he turned just briefly to hear this noise that was off to his, I think, right rear, he said, and he turned back and here was this thing that just like it appeared in front of him when he knows it didn't just popped in there. It was, it was probably in a prone position and then just, you know, popped up suddenly in front of him. So, uh, we tend to move a little slower because we're, we're kind of out of our element mm -hmm. as an, as a species in nature, you know, we've created this, uh, artificial environment for ourselves. So we've kind of lost a lot of the abilities we probably had many thousands of years ago, but these creatures and other animals still retain there. So, um, I, I think things that they're able to do kind of surprise us. Agreed. Um, I've told people many times, because uh, they say we don't really have any evidence or very much evidence of them when they go walking in the woods. I know for myself and my family and I go walking in the woods, how many times have you actually seen any wildlife or any traces of wildlife? We know they're there, deer, right. fox, whatever doesn't you know that we know they exist so these people that say that well bigfoot can't exist because we've never you know i've never seen it in the woods well how many times have you seen a fox or a wolf or whatever exactly and you know and they're because quiet of, because of our history uh in dealing not just with ourselves but all kinds of wildlife i was telling uh I've told people before that you know up until i i can remember until i was growing up in the 60s and 70s that it was very commonplace to just go shoot at anything mm -hmm. on your property. It was no big deal to do that. Uh, in fact, my dad used to say, you know, if something comes up, you know, in the yard, shoot it mm -hmm. because it might be rabid. So that was the thinking. Um, and it's only been in recent times that our behavior is changing away from that to, uh, to a great extent. So when, and I think a lot of that, you know, animals, you know, they pick up on things like that. You know, if they know, if they know something is dangerous, they're going to stay away from it, which is us. We're dangerous. Yep. Uh, and even our posture, our upright posture, uh, my early anthropology training, they talked about that. That is, it's an aggressive posture in the animal kingdom, being upright like we are. And, and a lot of animals will stay away from us because of things like that. Even uh, from what I've told, not, I could be totally wrong off, on, about this, but even the way that we smile, apparently uh, yeah, a lot of creatures, teeth. yes, exactly. Uh, that is not, uh, you know, it's a sign of aggression when we smile. Well, and, and in nature, um, animals don't really want to fight. 
and the reason is because if you get scratched or injured in nature, it could be a death sentence. Mm -hmm. So posturing is a big deal. Um, and, and our smile is sort of in the primate world is, is what they call a lip flip. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you show when you bare your teeth, that's showing, that's showing you're an opponent, you know, what, where the, what the goods are, you know, that, Hey, yeah. I'm dangerous. You need to stay away. And certainly our smile could, could, uh, uh, reflect that, you know, we think it's one thing, you know, other animals view it as something else entirely. Yeah, for sure such a fat it, there's just so many um oh what's the word i'm trying to look for um oh geez so sorry um, there's a lot of facets to this yes yes exactly and um but there why do you think all of a sudden people whereas before we assumed that it was a primate and all of a sudden it, it seems to have all these abilities that is it because people are having a hard time because, um, as you said earlier, when we have a hard time um, knowing what we just saw, if we can't can't put, um, if if we have a hard time understanding what we just saw, our mind kind of kind of fills in the blanks. So, do you exactly. think it has anything like that as to I, I why think, all of a sudden? I think a lot of that, uh, and, and especially these days, where um, a lot of people, you know unfortunately don't read you know it's kind of the fast food society where mm. they want something in small doses and quick yes and usually it's in video uh, version and um so it's easy to kind of jump to conclusions especially with a lot of you know fantasy and science fiction and things like that out there it's really easy to kind of put attributes onto something and now this subject is something that's it's a lot of work just to get small pieces of information very time consuming um and, and a lot of people don't want to do that work it's very non-tangible too so it's you might go a hundred times in the field and come up with something once or twice um it, it takes a lot to really stick to it so it's easier to jump to quick answers to to fill in gaps than it is to really kind of get down in the trenches and, and dig for those answers it's very similar to um, investigating uh, ghosts. Uh, a lot of people are gung-ho to want to go investigate, but when it comes time to going over um, video and audio, uh, they just don't want to do it. It's right, time exactly. To, it's too labor-intensive. They just they lose interest. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like... Uh, I don't want to. I don't really like comparing these fields with the television shows, but it's almost like after watching those television shows, they expect everything to be like that in reality, and they're going to get all the information right away. Well, no, it's a lot of hard work. <laughs> it is a lot of hard work. I, <laughs> we we interviewed a guy in Florida uh, a couple of days ago. He's he, he's a real crack up, uh, <laughs> but he deals in a lot with a lot with television shows behind the scenes. And he said, you know, a lot of these shows are just plain garbage. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's entertainment, which, you know, I know that. Yeah, it's a business. Uh, it is a business. So, yeah. and you're right. Everything is sort of packaged to fit within a certain time frame for a mm -hmm. particular show or series of shows. And it doesn't show what really goes on. And, yeah. and, and people get burned out very quick. I've seen so many people come and go uh, in my subject over the years. It's because they, they, they jump in, they get a little bit of attention, and they think they're an expert, and then they can't produce anything more because they're not willing to, you know, roll their sleeves up and really dig into it. And get, get dirty. <laughs> get dirty, that's right. Yeah. And so, bored and everything else that comes yeah. with the territory. Yeah, because going over evidence, I'm sure it's the same thing in your field, is uh, can be really, it's, really boring because you don't go over it just once. You have to go over it a, a bunch of times with a fine-tooth comb. It, yeah, exactly, and it's very tedious. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you can't have anybody disturbing you. It can be, uh, but at the same time, it's, it's boring, but yet it's interesting at the same time. I, maybe that's why we, we do it, but. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to find the answers that we've, we've always been looking for. So, so what made you actually do all the research that you've been doing? Did you, and did you expect that you'd be doing it for so long? No, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> you know, when I got, when I got when when Rene DeHinden came to my home, him and a guy named Dennis Gates, uh, who was an investigator from Cedar Woolley, Washington, in the summer of '75, 
um, he he wanted to know what I saw, and and so I told him, and he says, well, you know, we're we're camped just a few miles from here, uh, and it was a place, you know, people familiar with the subject uh, would know as the Puyallup Screamer when that stuff was going on in Puyallup, Washington, in in the early seventies. So he said, well, he says, why don't you, uh, you know, come to the camp and and meet John Green and and some of the other guys that are there. So I said, okay, sure. You know, I was a 17-year-old kid, and I had just a, a couple months prior read John Green's book, so I knew who these people were he was talking about. Yeah. And I guess I was a little bit starstruck because, you know, back then you see somebody in a book, uh, you know, you equate that with them being famous. Exactly. So me and a friend went there, and we spent spent a couple of days with those guys. And um, and it was fascinating for sure. But uh, – before they went back to British Columbia, Green and Hendon, they both asked me uh, if I would be their eyes and ears in that area. And especially Rene de Hendon was really good. He would send me letters once or twice a month and, and usually all kinds of interesting stuff like he had produced postcards uh, from the Patterson film of the famous frame. Mm-hmm. And he used to send me a, a fistful of those every time. And I think because, you know, I was just, like I said, I was a 17 year old kid. I think they, they took a liking to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so they, they, you know, when we would go get serious and we'd go look for things and, and occasionally we'd come up with stuff and, uh, you know, they, they just stayed friends all those years. And, uh, for me, it was about getting answers. I wanted to know more about something that was in an area because I, I grew up hunting and fishing, and I really enjoyed that and being out in the forest. And after running into two of them at a fairly close distance, um, that was not a pleasant experience. <laughs> and I wanted to know what was out there that I needed to watch for, mm-hmm. aside from you know the normal animals you watch for bear and things like that. And uh, you know, the the more you learn, the more questions come up. So I've just kind of stayed the course with it. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. Were you leery to tell people about your encounter in the beginning? Well, yeah, I'll tell you, when we, that day in 1972, when my buddy Mark and I got back to my parents' house, we didn't know anything about this stuff. We were excited to tell, hey, there's, we found these, these huge footprints and all this stuff. And my sisters and parents just laughed us out of the house. <laughs> so, you know, when you're a kid like that, that tends to make you clam up pretty quickly. So, <laughs> no kidding. So the evening that I, I ran into these two creatures in 1974, um, it was it was fairly traumatic. So I, I come in the house and uh, put my rifle away, and I, I went to the phone immediately, and I called my friend John, who he was the guy uh, we were on his way on our way to his house in 1972. So I called John and I talked very quietly on the phone so nobody else in the house could hear, <laughs> told him what had just happened. So um, we sort of kept it between ourselves, me and me and a few of my friends. And in fact, it would have never gotten out except we were, we were on the after school activities bus one evening and, and there weren't very many of us on the bus, but uh, John and I were sitting next to each other and we were talking very quietly about this incident. And uh, one of our friends overheard us, and, and he was a, a, a quiet guy, really not many friends, and he wanted to interview me. So I, I thought, well, you know, it's not ever going to go anyplace. You know, he's a good guy. He won't, doesn't know anybody to, send, to say anything to. So I told him, and um, a short time after that, he gave me John Green's first three books. They were, they were kind of a magazine-like book. Mm-hmm. And, and I couldn't believe there was that much information out there about this stuff. So I poured over the books and then um, I didn't know that he had written John Green and told him about what had happened to me. And that's really? why DeHinden came to my house that summer. I, hmm. I had no idea. That's amazing. You must have been excited about that. I, I was. I Well, I was, you know, it's funny when you're a teenager, you go through spells where you, you're, you're normally out and very active. And I was a very active teenager. But for some reason this afternoon, it was kind of overcast in the summer, which, you know, in Washington State, that happens. <laughs> and I was sleeping in my room. And one of my sisters came in and said, hey, there's there's two men out of your sea. And I'm kind of, two men? I don't know any men. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> so I slide my barn boots on and I walk out to the back. And and here's Renee Hinden walking up to the house. I recognized him immediately from the book. Mm-hmm. 
And I was just like, wow, you know, what's, what's he doing here? How do you know to come to see me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he told me, and I thought, oh, okay, okay. So uh, did he, he, he must have pretty much interviewed you to find out more about your encounter? Yeah, that's, that's what he was doing. They, yeah. Him and, he and Dennis Gates came to interview me, and, um, you know, I, I showed him a place where I had the encounter, and uh, we chatted a bit, and that's when he said, hey, you know, if you'd like, come. this is where our camp is, come and, you know, come and see us and meet Green. And, uh, and there was a state trooper there by the name of Mark Pittenger, and he had seen, he saw all three, there were actually three in that group, he saw all three of them, I saw two of them. But when we compared notes, you know, it was obvious we had seen the same individuals. Mm -hmm. Can you describe them for the listeners? Well, it, not not a great deal different than what you see in Patterson's film, mm -hmm. uh, except um, it was when I didn't. It was it was starting to get dark, so some of the some of the creature, the the main one uh, that I walked in on, the other one came around behind me afterwards. Uh, <clears throat> so the upper body was. There was a lot more shading on that one because the sun was, it was at dusk, sun was almost down. So I could see fairly, pretty well, but not great on the upper body. The lower body, I could see very well. Uh, first thing that caught my attention was its right foot. It was moving its right foot in the leaves. Um, and, and the hair was probably, it was a dark brown, probably, I would say, four to six inches long. Didn't go all the way down on the foot. It went down to maybe two or three inches <clears throat> above where the toes start on the foot, and then it would hang over somewhat on the toes. Um, skin was kind of a grayish color, uh, you know, dirty nails and dirt. <clears throat> Hair had a lot of uh, a lot of material, like, you know, when you go through a brush, little mm -hmm. pieces of stuff get in it. So it was kind of like that. I, I would say it wasn't really dirty, but it was kind of, I mean, not comb, not like you would see in the Patterson film, where it looks kind of, <laughs> kind of like it was brushed. Yeah. Uh, it was a little, little more, a little uh, matted, unkempt. a little matted, like it, yeah. like, like when you go through brush, things like that happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> body size, I mean, it was just a big solid block. It, it wasn't, wasn't really tapered. It was, and I'm guessing it was a male because <clears throat> the upper body size was very large. And I learned later in my anthropology training that. Uh, with primates, you can tell, uh, generally speaking, whether something is a male or a female because where the center of gravity is in males, it's it's up yeah. in the chest. Mm -hmm. In the females, it's lower in the hips. So, um, uh, arms were down by its knees. Uh, it, across the shoulders, it was probably four to five feet across the shoulders. It was around eight feet high. I was probably five nine or five ten at the time. And it was a good two feet above me, and I was only about fifteen or twenty feet away from it. Um, hair covered most of the face, uh, except for the nose and just around the eyes. Was it was shorter there? Um, I mean, it was. It was. It wasn't. Wasn't a lot distinctive to it in terms of detail, other than because of the lighting and the size, you know, and being hair covered. They just stood there and stared at me. Uh, when I came through the trees and encountered it, it stopped moving. Um, and we just sort of, I mean, what seemed like an eternity, I'm sure it was just a few seconds, but it seemed like and here was a standoff. And I thought to myself, you know, first, oh my God, what is this? <laughs> you know, yeah. and I thought, okay, now what do I do? You know, it's not moving. I'm not moving. Uh, and I thought, well, I had a 22 in my hands and I, I shot in here just to see if that would scare it off and it didn't. Oh. It brought another one around that was behind me from my right rear and it came walking around and and that one was it was about a head shorter than the first one and probably it was lighter. I, I don't know how much by how much the first one uh, was massive. I, I guessed at least 800 pounds because like I said the shoulder width and it didn't taper down a great deal when you when you come down the body it was it was rather like a big stump almost hmm. um, and um, and the feet the feet and I think we measured those it was around eighteen inches long the tracks were on that um, you know six seven inches wide around the ball of the foot six inches or so around the heel um, 
And even when the other one came around, I said, that's it, I'm gone. I took off running, hoping it wasn't breathing down my neck. Either yeah. one of them. And, and they didn't, thankfully. So um, that was kind of that. You must have Couldn't wondered see. if you must have wondered if there was two if, if there's actually more than that well you know at the moment i didn't think much else except getting the heck out of there uh, yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah it i was, guess it was only it was only later after i guess <clears throat> you know my friends john john and i and a couple of the other guys we we talked about it but not in a great detail i mean when we found the prince in 72 in the snow we found three different sets of tracks there so hmm. we knew there were at least three um and then when I start, talked to the state trooper, Mark Pittenger, he actually saw all three of them. So that was sort of the thinking at that time. It was just three in that group. Mm -hmm. uh, we never saw any evidence of any more of them. Was that his first time of uh, seeing them or had he seen them before? No, that, his first time was he was sitting in his patrol car on the side of the road and doing some paperwork uh, at, at night. And he heard a noise and it was, if you could picture it, City where he was at the road, it was kind of a oh, there wasn't really anything out in that area back then. Uh, and so, if he was sitting on the side of the road, just a two lane road, and there were some steep kind of steep embankments on both sides that went up, oh, I don't know, you know, 10 12 feet or so, and he heard a noise to his right, and he had his headlights on, he was just pulled over and sitting there, and he heard this noise, and he looked up and he saw these things walked within five feet of the front of his patrol car. <laughs> and took a couple wow. steps across the road and up the other embankment. And uh, he was a little in shock. <laughs> I, I would imagine. That's pretty close. It was close, yeah. I mean, they apparently didn't care that he was sitting there, lights on, nothing. Obviously didn't see him as a threat. <laughs> uh, no. no, apparently not. <laughs> wow. I, I just, I, I've never had an encounter and I really, I'm okay with that. You know, I t everybody says, oh, you know, I'd love to see one. And no, I thanks. tell them, no, no, you don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's there's two kinds of encounters, mostly. Mm -hmm. One like mine was, and I actually, 14 years later, in 1988, I saw another one uh, in southern Washington. That's the other kind of encounter. That's the one everybody wants. You know, where, where I, I came around the bend in this road along, along the Washougal River, and I uh, was just kind of thinking how beautiful the water was. It was really clear, kind of a... Oh, aqua marine color. It was just gorgeous. And uh, we had found, we had been finding tracks up near the snow line, snow line above that area. So we were on our way. And there was a group of us in the car. And um, I was as I was just thinking about a place I grew up fishing near Mount Rainier. It looked just like that water. So I was kind of reminiscing. And then I saw movement when I come around this bend. And on the other side of the river, and it was only about maybe 40 feet away. Uh, was this massive gray Sasquatch. It was way bigger than the first one I saw. And it it was only there a couple of moments and, because it was right next to some really thick brush. And mm -hmm. everybody in the car saw it except for my uh, the girlfriend I, w I was with at the time. She was lo looking at a book, so she didn't see it, but <sighs> everybody else saw it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then I, I had interviewed other people in the area that had seen exactly the same creature, but... That's the kind of sighting everybody wants. You know, you're in a car. It's a, on the other side of a barrier. Mm -hmm. You get to see it and it goes away. Um, but unfortunately, most people have the first kind of encounter. You know, sort of the up, up close and personal and, and, and wet your pants kind of a situation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you remember uh, two, three years ago, I had sent you an email. Uh, family and I, when we were living in Alberta, uh, we were heading towards uh, Jasper National Park for a couple of days to do some camping before we moved back to Ontario. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading on my phone about Bigfoot encounters in Alberta. And I can't remember the name of the community, um, but there was an encounter, I think it was like two years prior uh, to when I was reading it. And all of a sudden my daughter goes, uh, what's that? And we looked and we're on the highway and there's there's forest on either side. And... Um, <laughs> there was this horse that was dead on, on the side of the highway, just on the outside of the tree line. And the whole back end of it was just destroyed. I didn't get as good of a look as my daughter oh, did. Boy. And when I looked to see where we were, it was it not the same location that I was just reading about the, where there was Bigfoot encounters. 
Oh, isn't that coincidental? I have been trying to find, <laughs> I know. And I just kind of looked at my husband and I said, okay. And I told him what I just read. I said, we're just driving through there. So apparently this is Bigfoot Valley. So I've been trying to find out ever since then, if there was anything, anywhere I could find of what happened to that horse. Um, perhaps a transport truck hit it. I don't, I don't know. But from the way that my daughter described it, she said it looked like an animal had shredded the, the, the hindquarters. Uh, but again, we're driving and we got a quick look, but I have never, ever in seen a dead horse on the side of the road. And we've driven across Canada a couple of times. And um, it was very, very unusual. And I, yeah, it's been really at the back of my mind. It's, it's kind of been bothering me. I wanted to know what it was and if it was potentially a Bigfoot attack on that poor horse. That's possible. I mean, it could be, it could be a big cat also, uh, because they'll go after the back, you know, hindquarters. From now. It depends on, you know, it, you could speculate all kinds of things until you actually, you know, can examine and see, yeah. was it claw marks, you know, or what exactly happened. But yeah. um, it is possible, sure. I remember looking at my husband and said, oh my God, we should turn around and go take a look at it so we can maybe take pictures or whatever and take a look at it. And right. he says, are you kidding me? If it was a Bigfoot, do you really want to take a look at that? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> good point. Lunch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I said, good point. Let's just keep going. Oh, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's been, uh, it's, I've always, it's, uh, my interest is peaked. I've never, and, and every once in a while, even now, I keep Googling to see if there was any horse attack reports of wildlife or anything but I haven't found anything oh interesting I, um yeah I, i'd be interested to know exactly what what community it's near and then i mean there are ways to look it up yeah um i'll try and figure i'll try and find out what the name of the community was and maybe uh, email you and uh i don't know maybe you can find something yeah we'll take a look I'm sure you have more resources than I do. <laughs> we, we have we have ways of finding out things. Yes, <laughs> you know people. <laughs> I know people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we used to have a, a neighbor a few years ago, and uh, no matter what you needed, if it was car parts, radio parts, or or, or whatever, he he was always saying, "I know a guy. <laughs> Let me get back to you." <laughs> so I, I yeah, know if you've heard heard our our, our show where we have. Uh, I have a friend who's um, he's now retired, retired judge, uh, and he's from an Italian family. So he, he says things like that. And he just cracks us up. <laughs> just, I know people. Yeah, I know people. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Now, I had um, a listener email me um, last month uh, from Quebec. I can't remember the name of the community. I have to look it up. And I won't reveal his name, though. Um, sure. But he says... Um, he had an encounter with uh, a Bigfoot, and he's been trying to find, he, he hasn't been able to be very, he wasn't successful at finding out very much about Bigfoot encounters in Quebec. And hmm. he wants to get together um, with like-minded, because I'm sure there's groups in Quebec that have hmm. had experiences. So he's looking to um, uh, hook up with uh, some group that um, have also had experiences. So... Um, if you happen to know of any groups in Quebec, uh, I'm sure he would appreciate it if I could uh, send him some information. Yeah, let me see what I can find and we'll get him set up. Sure. And I told him, I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a lot more uh, Bigfoot encounters in Quebec because that's a pretty big province and uh, lots of oh, forested yeah. areas. And uh, But he's... Uh, I don't, I don't know if he quite knows where to look for resources to find out about other encounters. So, oh, Okay, I could probably help him with that. Okay. Yeah, even if you just wanted to, um, after we, we done recording, or if you wanted, <clears throat> excuse me, if you wanted to email me and I can forward that on to him. Um, he's, he's really interested in finding out more. Okay. Yeah, that's, I'll do that. It'd be easier. Yeah, perfect. Um, I thank you for him. <laughs> I'm sure any little, any information he'll greatly appreciate because he, uh, I was really happy that he reached out to me. Um, and he, he said he'd heard uh, my show and he was uh, happy to hear that I wasn't too far from him. Uh, being in the Ottawa Valley now in Ontario, uh, he was happy to know that there was a, a show on uh, unexplained creatures and, and whatnot, uh, not too far from him. So he, uh, he reached out and, uh, Unfortunately, like I said before, I don't know a whole lot about 
about uh, Bigfoot, but I said, mm -hmm. I, uh, I know people. <laughs> you know people. <laughs> I know people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've been looking, uh, trying to find out some information for him. So um, I'm sure he'll, he'll be very, very happy to hear that. Okay, good. Yeah. So you've done a little bit of research in uh, Canada as well. I, I think you've told me that before, that you've actually been here and researched. A little bit, yeah. Hmm. Any place it's, in Canada in particular that has the most uh, encounters that you know about? Well, British Columbia. Yeah. Um, obviously, that's the most area. Um, there are things in eastern Canada, though. Mm -hmm. um, mostly with the native folks there. Um, I, I'm still got to meet up with a, a friend in the eastern part of the country here who did a bunch of work up there with the native folks. Uh, he's native himself, mm -hmm. and um, he's going to kind of fill me in on that. But um, most, like I said, for myself, and it's, and it's other people that work with me that have done a lot of the work up there. But uh, and like I said, especially Western British Columbia and north up in the Yukon area. Yeah. My uh, daughter, quite a few years ago, was doing... Um uh, little research on uh, something for school and she decided to do it on um, uh, Bigfoot and uh, see if there was any cor correlation with um, see if I'm pronouncing it right gigantic but gi oh geez gigantopithecus Gig gigantopithecus <laughs> thank you, you yes it. <laughs> yes <laughs> it's a tongue twister and she had mentioned that she found out that uh, there's actually been encounters of Bigfoot in Algonquin Park that's not too far from here it, it's a huge park but mm -hmm. and one of her classmates he was going to be going camping with his family not you know in the near future and he's like great i don't know if i want to go now <laughs> <laughs> but she had uh, figured out the dates and everything and it had, it had been quite a while but uh yeah she she told him i'm pretty sure where you're going to be camping it's going to be pretty safe so <laughs> <laughs> just tell him don't be alone <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> make sure with a bunch of other campers <laughs> exactly yeah um, yeah, even uh, I'm originally from New Brunswick, and there have been a few encounters that I've been able to find in the Maritimes as well. But oh yeah, uh, it's such yeah. a small, uh, small province that there hasn't been uh, too many that have been logged anyways that I've been able to find. You know, a lot of people just don't report things. No. Um, I, I've gotten things from moose hunters. Uh, I, I one one set of moose hunters. In fact, I'm trying to remember where they were. Uh, I want to say it was in the eastern part of Canada, but I, I can't remember off the top of my head without looking. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they came across a line of tracks, some really good ones, fresh ones. So they, they took pictures and sent me the pictures. Um, and I, I said, oh, yeah, that's that's what you got. Yeah. Of course, they're out in the middle of nowhere, you know, I mean, way out in the middle of nowhere. And, and these beautiful bare foot tracks going through uh, several different kinds of materials. So that was interesting. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, yeah, they they're definitely around. They're everywhere. <laughs> they're everywhere. Yeah. Now, some people claim that they've had really, really good encounters with uh, with Bigfoot, where they've actually left gifts to each other, and others have had negative uh, encounters. You know, rocks being thrown at them. Do you oh, think yeah. these could potentially be the same type of creature, or are these people encountering something different? Well, like with anything, I mean, you can look at people, you can look at chimps, gorillas, mm -hmm. you've got different personalities but among individuals. So mm -hmm. um, now these creatures do seem to have a little bit of more nasty temperament overall, mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't say, doesn't mean that there aren't the occasional one that um, it is not like that so much. And it depends. There's a lot of factors, how well it's eaten that particular day, what kind of mood it's in. Uh, is the person encroaching on some kind of a territorial mm -hmm. uh, situation? Uh, are they close to other members? Are they uh, disturbing a hunt? There's just lots of things that go into that. So it's really a mixed bag. Uh, you have to know the bigger context of what's going on. And most people don't, you know, when they have an encounter, they're seeing that kind of a microcosm uh, of that creature's day. Mm -hmm. uh, so... You know, without more information, it's really hard to tell. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's probably, I would say, the more frightening encounters outweigh the other ones, the good ones, by yeah. quite a lot. 
but you're you're dealing with wild creatures, so it's going to be that way. Yeah, you're not you're not sure how they're going to re react with you. Exactly, exactly, yeah. and they don't particularly like us anyway. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> and no. for good reason because of the way we've been throughout our history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I don't know if you're. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard of this story, and I I can't remember how many years. It's not maybe two three years that it happened. This little boy in the states, and I don't remember where. I remember he had gone missing. I want to say he was six. He was just very young. Went missing, and I think they found him the next day. Uh, far from where he had been missing from. And when they found him, and it was kind of cold that night, so they thought, mm -hmm. you know, we're not going to find him. Um, but he was fine, and he said a big monkey actually sheltered him. Do you do you recall ever hearing that in the news? I heard something of that, yeah. Do you think that that could have been a Bigfoot what, taking care of a, a child? It's possible. You know, I mean, like I said, with individuals... Um, you see a lot of weird things in nature, you know, yeah. fortunately he came out of the life. It could have been the other way, you know, they yes. could have had a, had a midnight snack. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and, and they, and they will take people on occasion. So, um, that's why I always tell people if you're out and about, don't, don't go alone. No. And, and that's, that's a recommendation for hikers and stuff anyway, because of big cats and other animals. Um, you, you know, they've gotten to be a lot more bold especially since we've changed our behavior and we don't shoot at things anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of animals are much more bold towards us. So it's just, and you could even mundane things like, you know, tripping and, and breaking a, a leg or something. Uh, you just don't want to be out alone. No. It's just safer that way. Yeah, because I'm pretty sure that if you're by yourself and you uh, trip and break a leg or something, that you probably don't have cell reception where you are. Exactly. And, and ex that's exactly it. a lot of places, you know, people rely on their phones, mm -hmm. but you get out away from uh, populated areas. And I know from my field work, it doesn't take being out very far before you don't have no, no cell reception. Uh, better know how to read a map, better have a map. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, it, a lot of those conveniences that we take for granted simply don't work everywhere. Yeah, my husband's always harping at me because there was a time that I could read a map, but now I rely too much on Google Maps on my phone. <laughs> so when he says, you know, do you know where you're going? I'm like, yeah, I'll just plot plot the address in my in my phone. And he just kind of looks at me like, really? Get the map and and figure it out. And I'm just, no, no, I'm good. And he, he's always harping at me. What if your phone doesn't work or if it dies or whatever? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. it's a good skill to have, you know. Exactly, yeah. And of course, he knows how to read a map, but... Um, like I said, there was a time I used to know how to do it, but and especially topographical maps. But um, oh, yeah. now I, I look at a map and I'm totally confused. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I picked the habit up in the Army. That was my job. Uh, I was a reconnaissance specialist. So mm. topo, topo maps were our bread and butter. Yeah. Uh, and as a cavalryman, a lot of times we would run past all the maps we carried with us. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was it was something I learned as a young person and then just kind of kept doing it. Um, you know, really liked looking at maps and, and working with them. Yeah, when I was younger, my father and I, well, my father was involved with uh, air search and rescue. And um, so I got into it with him, with him as well. And that's where I learned how to read the, the topographical maps. And it was really, really fascinating. Um, it really is. And, uh, yeah, now I can't make heads. I used to be able to drive on the highway and say, oh, uh, it's going to be so many uh, miles or kilometers until our next mm -hmm. destination. And it's going to take this many minutes. And now I look at it, I'm like, I don't know. I just, that's, <laughs> <laughs> I've lost the skill. <laughs> you know, that goes, that's a lot of things with us humans. I, I think, you know, we're so out of touch with what we were in mm -hmm. nature yep. thousands of years ago. Um, we've created this world around ourselves that's artificial and can fall apart very quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and there's so many skills that we really lack. It, it's kind of amazing. Um, and I'm sure, you know, these creatures and, and other things out there look at us like, these, these people are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My dad, every time we'd go for uh, family trips on the weekend and uh, all we'd have is, you know, food and, uh, Good old map and a compass. 
Yeah, I, I know when I was growing up, I used to go with a, we had a family friend that would take me fishing with him and stuff a lot when, we, when I was a kid. And uh, we took very little with us. He, I think he spent $5, you know, for the, the few little things he put in a box. And we take off with our fishing poles and had plenty of food and, you know, had a lot of fun. So for people who have had encounters, so you had mentioned earlier that there don't, don't seem to be a lot of people reporting their encounters. Do you think perhaps they don't know where to report them or maybe That's for fear or, or both? Well, both, certainly. And, you know, yeah. some people, they, they don't want a lot of intrusion in their lives. And I, and I get that a lot from people mm -hmm. because there, there's a lot of folks out there, unfortunately, in this subject um, that are trophy hunters. Mm -hmm. You know, they're looking for footprints, anything they can show everybody and say, hey, look, I'm an expert because I've got, you know, A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always been very, um, very mindful of people's privacy. Um, we investigated a situation back in 1989 and 90 in southern Washington state. Um, <clears throat> and the family, you know, unfortunately, the newspaper put their street address in, oh, in the article. Oh, no. And so oh, I saw it oh. and I thought, oh, geez, I, I knew all kinds of people were going to be yeah. there inundating these poor people. So I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I'm going to drive out and talk to them anyway. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, there there were, you know, several, three or four groups of people had been there before I got there. And they said, yeah, it, it's been more than we thought. But they, they told me their story and, and it was a fascinating story. So I did a little investigating and started finding a lot more than the other people came there again they were looking for footprints hair scat mm -hmm. they wanted the people's story and then they left and and the situation was and this was was uh, yakult washington and i actually wrote a book about it um the the um the family moved from wisconsin and bought 13 acres there and they were city folks so they didn't know anything about country living and um, they bought a horse because Lady of the House wanted to ride a horse. So she had the horse tied up by the barn. Uh, she was going to go riding. And her stepson was there with her 16-year-old, uh, Nick. And there was some kind of a noise. So she asked him if she would go out and check on the horse to make sure the ho rope wasn't tied up in its hooves. Um, so he goes out there and he sees what he thinks is a person. Um, now, if you picture looking, it's kind of a... a, in, a decline going down away from their their home and there was a, a tree line on the left and kind of an open field on the right so uh it appeared to nick there was a man walking along the tree line going away from the house so he goes running out there and gets fairly close and he slips on a branch on the ground and, and he falls down and this thing didn't hear him until he fell down and made the noise so it turned around and he said its eyes got really big it kind of reared its head back at first, and it leaned forward to look at him, almost like it was trying to get a better look. Hmm. And he said, then it put its arms out at 45 degree, degree angles, palms facing him with his fingers open, and it started walking towards him like it was hurting him. Huh. So he gets up and he runs back to the house, put on a different pair of boots, and goes running back out. I guess the boots he had on were weren't very good for his traction. So. Mm -hmm. So by this time, it was, had resumed its course back away from the house along the tree line. So he goes running after it. This time, it turns around and comes barreling after him. But it didn't, still didn't try to catch him. Uh, it just chased him up to the barn, and he climbed up on, uh, uh, there was a little outbuilding with feed in it next to the barn. So he climbed up on top of that, and it stood there for a while and, and made sure he wasn't coming down again. <laughs> and then it resumed its course. So I, I asked the folks, I said, well, did anybody that came here before me, did they go down and, and the direction the creature was going and see where it went? They said, no, nah, nobody was interested. Mm. <laughs> and I said, do you mind if I go look? Sure, we'll take you down there. So we all went down and I went across the small creek uh, into the next field. And there was a big cottonwood tree that had fallen over. And underneath, uh, not the root wad, but on the upper side where the uh, the base of the trunk of the tree was had been a um, a seasonal little pond there and it was dried up and in that dirt there were tracks all over the place of two young ones mm -hmm. and i said there you go yeah. this is why this is why this and that's that's how i investigate things i i want to know the whys 
Yep. What's what's it doing? What's it going to do? Where is it at? Those kind of things. And, and I, I didn't really care about. I mean, we took pictures and things, but you know, in terms of trophies, I don't I don't do trophies. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was just fascinating to me. Um, you know, investigating to find out what's going on here. And we ended up doing that for nine months at that location. There was just so much information uh, behaviorally and, and elsewhere, otherwise that we collected there. It was really amazing. Now, is this, I think I've heard you talk about this on, on your show before. Is this the family that you've, you've kept in touch with over the years? Uh, I'm yeah, we, I'm actually um, still friends with one of the, uh, uh, the, si uh, the siblings. Mm -hmm. on Facebook but yeah they've um, everybody of course you know went their own ways and sold the property and uh, but you know the, the whole thing about you know families being inundated like that and I understand I, I was trying to think where I was going with that but I remember so <laughs> <laughs> um, you know people not wanting to talk one mm -hmm. of the reasons is because of ridicule of course uh, another reason is they don't want to be have a bunch of people traipsing all over their their home and their property, and, yep. and you know I totally understand that. I mean, so I, I, I. I wouldn't I wouldn't want a bunch of people come running all over my home and asking a bunch of questions over and over again, and and just people's behavior is not real good these days. So no, um, and and sometimes they think also, well, we'll just leave the creatures alone, or it could be. Uh, and in a lot of people's cases, the way they're raised is just, you know, things like that they don't talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure uh, the majority of people who went to um, talk to this family, they probably were not respectful to them. And um, maybe they just want to make a name for themselves and, and say, hey, I found out about this story. Right. Well, one, yeah. of the, one, of the, one of the people, the groups did come back. Uh, months later, and, and it was, I've told the story before, it was hilarious. Um, two, two of my people on my team at the time were there, and I met them right at dusk. And, and instead of being in the, in the folks' yard, we would be just stand on the side of the road, so we weren't disturbing them. Mm -hmm. And we were just there monitoring, listening uh, to hear what was going on, because we would hear things almost every night up there. Uh, so we saw a car coming from the other direction from the town and we thought it was another one of our teammates coming and it wasn't, it was this little blue Porsche and this man and woman, they park near us and they get out and they start crossing the road to go up the hill. And I looked at him and I said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. <laughs> oh, I'm a biologist. I know what I'm doing. So they hopped over this barbed wire fence with their little backpacks and up the hill they went with their flashlights. I looked at my friends and I said, they'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> Within 20 minutes, we see these, and it was dark by then, these flashlights were just bobbing furiously as they were running down the hill towards us. And they just about killed themselves trying to get over that barbed wire fence. And we're standing there just staring at them. The guy jumps in the driver's side. He fires up the in his little Porsche. And the poor lady, she was hanging halfway out of the car, and he went <laughs> spinning around and taking off with her hanging out the oh, car. <laughs> <laughs> and my friend Don, he looks at me and he says, well, you hit that one right on the head, didn't you? <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, oh, we, learned, we learned that if we weren't out in their area after dark when they were doing whatever it is they're doing, it was okay for us to be there uh, on the highway or in the yard. Mm -hmm. uh, um, if we were out in their area, they got rather upset by that. So we sort of, we sort of uh, respected the boundaries. Yep. There. But it's just an example of people uh, not knowing what they're doing or caring what they're doing to just go charging off uh, off into the timber without thinking about a yeah. situation and, and what could happen and what they should or shouldn't be doing. I bet they didn't have any weapons on them, too. No, I'm sure they didn't. No. <laughs> 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 Always good to have something with you. Uh, not just for Bigfoot, but for whatever wildlife you are going to come across. Oh, yeah. And there are plenty of cougars around there. And, yep. Um, so, yeah, you always got to be mindful about wildlife. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> it was a funny. It was funny. I, it's one of my favorite stories. <laughs> I can always picture these people running down the hill and trying to get over that fence. That was hilarious. <laughs> Oh, geez. Uh, I guess it was dark. You probably wouldn't be able to tell, but I bet their faces were pale. 
Oh no, there was enough light shining from oh, from uh, the Goldhammer farm. From there, they had a big uh, outdoor light. We could oh, okay. we could see them clearly as they were trying to get over that <laughs> fence, and it was just it was it was something else. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad you could have taken pictures. <laughs> oh, I would have loved to have it videoed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, jeepers! <laughs> so we're almost at the end here, Will. Okay. Um, but I would like to ask one more question. So. People sure. who would like to, people who have had encounters and they want to report it to someone, who who do they go to? They can come to me. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to say help that people as much as I can. <laughs> yes. You know? um, so if they if they want to contact us, um, then contact me directly at, at my at my personal email, William Jevening at yahoo.com. Mm -hmm. Or then contact us at the show, and that's creekdevil.com. Okay. I will be putting up links in the show notes when uh, this gets released, so people will be able to find you easier. That way they don't have to go searching. It'll be Great. a that's, little that's easier. Awesome. Well, thank much you so very much. Oh, I, I really appreciate you being here, Will. It's, uh, like I said before, um, been a fan of yours for a while, been listening to you, and uh, I've kind of got a friendship over you know on online over the past few years so uh, I really appreciate that thank you very much oh I appreciate you too and and thank you so much thanks and um, if you have any um, do, oh yeah do you have any new books coming out um I'm kind of playing with a couple of manuscripts not too soon because I got some other big projects in the work so okay uh, I, I'm actually, I, I, two of the books are uh, what they call uh, Witness of the Unknown, Volume 1 and 2. I'm working on Volume 3 of that one right now. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, we record a lot of witnesses, but some witnesses don't want to, you know, come on the show and talk. So, yeah. uh, you know, if anybody's interested in just writing out what their experience was and emailing to me, uh, you know, if they want that in the book, you know, they can... Uh, you know, if they say, hey, you know, don't use my name or location, mm -hmm. that's that's awesome. I'm more interested in what happened. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Than telling people's names and things. I, I'm a I'm a really a big person on privacy, so Yeah. Well you can you have to be and it's um it shows people that you're you're you have a, a level of credibility as well. Well, I'm more concerned about people than I am making any kind of a name or anything for myself. I could care less about that, but I'm really interested in people and what happened to them and also keeping them uh, private. And safe. And safe, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so very much again. I really enjoyed this. Well, thank you, Kat. I appreciate it. Thanks. And uh, you take care. All right. You do the same. Thank you. Well, we've made it to the end of another episode. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, take care of each other. And if you'd like to be on the show or have questions and comments, just drop me an email, paranormalheart13 at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Paranormal Heart would like to extend a special thank you to PurplePlanet.com for supplying the music for the show. The views and opinions expressed on Paranormal Heart are those of the host and participants. 